Hello, I'm Kamila Shamsi. I'm the author of several novels, including Home Fire and Burnt Shadows. And I'm also a patron of the Manchester Literature Festival. Um, when I was asked to be a patron, I jumped at the chance because I knew I wanted my name associated with one of the world's most exciting festivals. There are many things I love about the Manchester Literature Festival, but primary among them is the fact that the organizers don't look at the question, who sold the most books? who's the most established author. Instead, they ask themselves, who is doing the most exciting work this year? Um, and those are the writers they invite, whether they're established, uh, whether they're newcomers, whether their work is available in English originally or in translation. Um, the Manchester Literature Festival also commissions very exciting new work. I've had the pleasure of being commissioned to uh, produce work around um, museum exhibitions or to read a uh, secular sermon in a cathedral, which was a pretty thrilling thing to be able to do. Um, and of course, the audiences are wonderful as well. Uh, this year, for reasons I don't need to go into, it's not going to be possible for the festival to run as usual. Um, but they're planning a digital weekend and they need funds. So if you can afford to help them, please do go to www.manchesterliteraturefestival.co.uk um, the price of a ticket or a cup of coffee is as much as we're asking. But if you can give more, of course, please do so. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Ladipo Manika, one of the contributors to the New Daughters of Africa anthology. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to this special Manchester Literature Festival event. In a short while, you'll get to hear some of the poets in this groundbreaking anthology perform their work. But first, I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be in conversation with pioneering publisher, writer and editor extraordinaire of Daughters of Africa and New Daughters of Africa, Margaret Busby. Thank Margaret, you, welcome. It's always a delight to see you, even if it's just virtually. Margaret, let's, let's begin by asking, can you tell us about the genesis of Daughters of Africa and New Daughters of Africa? Well, for Daughters of Africa, we have to go back to the late 1980s. Was that before you were born? Maybe not. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I thought so, yes. <laughs> and I met this, this uh, enthusiastic young editor called Candida Lacey, who was working with a, a feminist company called Pandora. And they had done an anthology of British women writers in English, two editors. And we talked about doing an anthology of writings by women of African descent. And it was Candida's enthusiasm, she brought me on board. And I said, fine, okay, well, I'll do it. I'll do the world in every language on my own. <laughs> so that's how it started. And then Candida moved to uh, another publisher and eventually to Cape, which is where the book came out from Jonathan Cape in 1992. And the reason I wanted to do the anthology was that back in those, you know, the, the late 80s, early 90s, you'd have thought there were very few women of African descent who were writing. And of course, as you and I know, there were many who had been writing for decades, generations, hundreds of years. And so I wanted to have some way of showcasing some of those works, some of those writing, some of that creativity to a wider audience, so that although there were there were names who had already um, become household names, if you like, in thinking of Maya Angelou or Alice Walker or Toni Morrison, but there were 
many all those names were the ones that had to stand in for everybody anywhere. So anytime anybody spoke about a black woman writer, there were a handful of names that came up. And I wanted to say, yes, those are great names. And they're all in the Daughters of Africa, but actually there are hundreds more. So that was the genesis of Daughters of Africa. It came out and it, it did very well. And then it eventually it went out of print and roll on a couple of decades. And Candace and I thought, well, it's a shame we haven't got Daughters of Africa, but let's try another volume and let's try and let it have a legacy so that it's not just a volume that comes and goes. So we started to think about new Daughters of Africa. And again, there are hundreds of women who are potential contributors who are maybe not in it, but there are 200 plus women who are in it. I'm delighted. But I, you know, I, I think of all the other women who could have been in it. So it's, it's it's really a way of showing there's an endless pool of creativity that comes from the female imagination of African descent. And I wanted to find a way of show, like, showcasing, highlighting some of those, those women who, going back to the 18th century in, in this case, have, have been making such wonderful, I don't know how to put it, which just... Mm. Creativity is, is just so amazing. It is hard to know how to put it because it is such a magnificent, or they are both such magnificent books. Let's focus on- And you're in it, so you're magnificent too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll just compliment each other here. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, let's just focus on New Daughters of Africa. As you said, mm. In both anthologies, there are hundreds of writers across time, across nations. How did you go about collecting the pieces and selecting them? Uh, let's perhaps focus on New Daughters of Africa. It was an amazing task. I, I had a spreadsheet, hundreds of names on it, possibilities, a wish list, all the people who I would, would have liked to have in it. I mean, if, if I'd had... A, a, a scope to do a, a, a book of about, you know, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand 4,000 pages, I would have had many more writers in. So I, I started with all of those writers that I knew of. Sometimes other people suggested writers to me going back over the, the, the centuries, people who were starting out now. So it was a range of writers who, some of them were well-known, others were not yet well-known. And I wanted to show that there is some sort of link and some way that the writers inspire each other. In fact, there were many writers in New Daughters of Africa who had been inspired by Daughters of Africa. And I, I found that fascinating. Writers who said, well, it's when I read Daughters of Africa, I realized I could be a writer wherever I was from. I could be a writer of African descent and be part of this sisterhood. So that, that was really the way I started, just a wish list. And then how do I contact all these people? Have I got their email addresses? Will they reply to me? And Coach yes. Kendall and I had spoken about trying to find a way to have it continue as a legacy. We thought, well, let's try and have some sort of charitable outcome. I mean, not charitable in that sense, but some sort of award that will come as a result of the, contrib the contributors being generous enough to waive their fees. So that's what everybody in this anthology did. They waived their fees, as a result of which there's a wonderful award, which is called, I think it's called the, the Margaret Busby New Daughters of Africa Award, which is a collaboration between Myriad Editions, the British publisher, and the School of Oriental and African Studies at London University and International Student House, which means that woman student of African descent coming from Africa will have a free course of study and accommodation at SOAS because of this anthology. And the first recipient has just been announced and I, I think will be starting around now. And, and we hope it'll continue and that, that there'll be many more people who will be able to continue that legacy and study literature, language, whatever is connected with that sort of creativity that we've showcased in this book because of the anthology and because of the, the generosity of the contributors. In fact, I, I gave you all a name. I, I gave you all 
an award which I call VOTAS, which stands for the Venerable Order of True African Sisterhood. So it's all those contributors, you included, who waived their fees to enable this award to take place. And it's such an honor to be a member of VOTAS. And I, I was sort of smiling to myself as you said, oh, I, I, I'm not quite sure what the award, the fellowship is called. I, I think it's the Margaret Busby Fellowship. And of course, that's a, a complete illustration of your humility. Um, so I just had to put that in there. Margaret, I as you asked whether I wanted my name on it. <laughs> I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you weren't because I know what your response would have been. Um, Margaret, as you were pulling all these amazing names together, hundreds of people, hundreds of writers, were there some that were new to you, new voices, new writers, as you were putting it together? Of course, there were many that were new to me. There were many suggested to me by other, other writers. I mean, I, I might have written to, I don't know, Zadie Smith and said, this is what I'm trying to do. And, and she might have said, well, have you thought of so-and-so and so-and-so? And so there were ways in which the word spread. And I wasn't curating it in the sense of saying, I'm going to this writer because I want poetry. I, I would go to a writer and say, would you like to contribute something in any genre, on any topic? Um, there's a maximum space we can allocate because we want to have as many people as possible. And it was amazing that, you know, I'd write to a novelist and get that poetry or I'd, I'd write to somebody who was known for something else and, and they'd send me something that I was not expecting. So it was a wonderful thrill to to get the contributions and to see what people were willing to try and to send and to suggest. And there is, there are, I mean, if, if anybody reads the, the contents list and thinks, well, there are people who are not in it, well, I think that too. And I think, well, why didn't they, did, maybe they didn't get my email, maybe it went astray. Then there were people who missed the deadline. So, you know, I can have a, a whole other book tomorrow and, and, and not repeat myself. And, and this is something that you stress all the time, that there are so many more voices. Uh, so we need, I think we need another anthology soon. Oh, but in, in conclusion, um, Margaret, I wonder if you can just say a few words about what your thoughts are on the literary landscape of this amazing wealth of writing. And what would you like to sort of be the takeaway for people as they get New Daughters of Africa? Well, I would like people to think that a woman of African descent can write anything. If you are a woman of African descent, you don't have to be defined by someone else. You can write whatever you choose to write. And I think what we have to also try and remember is how much we influence each other, how much we support each other, how much we inspire each other. And I, I think that to me has been the lesson I learned from Doors of Africa, continuing into new Doors of Africa and seeing the links. And sometimes they're familiar links. Sometimes somebody who was in the first volume is related to somebody in the second, whether it's Alice Walker was in Doors of Africa, Rebecca Walker is in new Doors of Africa or Mabel Dub was in Daughters of Africa. Nala Dub, her, her niece, is in New Daughters of Africa. Or actually, even people related in the same volume, because in New Daughters of Africa, we have Zadie Smith and we have Yvonne Bailey Smith, who's Zadie Smith's mother, who, having finished a career as a therapist, is now a writer. So there's a continuation in that way. And, and you see in the pieces, you can see the way writers refer to their, their foremothers and talk about the inspiration they've drawn from, whether it's something like Audrey Lord or, or, or any of the writers in the first volume who were the ones who were the, the, the inspired the next generation. And there are people in this new volume who were born in the 1990s, but it begins with somebody who was born in the 1790s. So it just shows you that it's not just the, the new writers that we're con con we're conscious of now. We have to hold on to that historical legacy, that 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 inspiration that has united us and, and carries us forward. And that's just a wonderful place to bring this to a conclusion. Past, present, future. 
Margaret, thank you so much. And I would recommend that everyone gets a copy of this brilliant anthology and discover lots of- Just out in paperback. <laughs> right, brilliant. And, and uh, discover lots of new and exciting writers for yourselves. So, but first, before you rush out and get that, please join me in some readings from Joanna Dema, Lola Shonei, Aja Monet, and Bridget Minimal. Hello, and thank you for joining us um, for this New Daughters of Africa event as part of the Manchester Literature Festival 2020. I'll be reading three poems as part of this session. One, born sleeping. I didn't know the child was coming till it was gone. I regret that more than the loss. More than the wrench of loss is loss itself. The thing never there where it was before. It's miserly hand stirring at the smallest thought. It's clench and yank, no use what ifs, strapped to the back like a newborn, a spectre of sharp teeth tight at the nipple. No one, no one to say breathe, just upward punch through belly and lung, the smallest nick there and there, a fistful of blood and more. More than all, the could have beens is the was, a perfect face, small in the mind's rear view, coming, coming till it's gone. One, two, pugilist. Not yet a 13 with your slipped jaw, dancing its talk of obvious pain, bloodied nose glistening, you come to our distraught mother, broken mouth open, certain that you are no longer at ease in this kingdom of boyhood and glad to meet its death at your own hand. One, two, three, confinement. To make a child narrow the birth. When you have a baby, she'd place the words on her tongue like a thing that's done. I'd think of now as never. Me, 36, arms empty and still frowning into cribs, rubbing sleeping infants' cheeks to see if this wanting is catching. I think I know now when I became immune. As a small child myself, I'd been the one sent to fetch when the new mom couldn't move, confined as much by tight stitch as tongue. Don't let anyone visit. Don't eat from the family bowls. Don't let anyone but these women hold the child. Offered she'd stare at nothing except the baby in her arms and the log at the gate meant that everyone knew that only their good wishes could enter, their bodies, their diseases, all that chatter they could keep well outside the yard and its doughy new guest. Even the father wouldn't see it till its knotted cord fell off. He knew nothing, nothing of all the bloody screaming, the noisy stench and mess of it all. For three months, it be this dance, too much seen by one and not enough by the other, the language of ritual and taboo, an old fence. For years I frowned at the old women and their fraying ways, how they kept the father out dancing his own dance despite knowing how, sometimes a girl who'd never had other women stare between her thighs with brisk empathy would hold his eye and think him a ship in that distant light. I know now what the old women knew then, 
how sore the new mother and how greedy the infant and the one who helped her make it. Hi, my name is Aja Monet, and I'm going to read two poems. The first poem is called Hexes. And there was a reckoning for all the harm and for all the evil eyes, and our strength was cute until it wasn't. And we were weak until we weren't. And your longing will be long, and your days will be numbered. And we are counting on the stems who had their petals taken in this spell for flowers, on the busted lips and bruised cheeks. And there was loss, and our smiles will terrify you because we will be laughing and we will be cruel and there will be no remorse and your children will be ours. And we will make new ways without you and you will miss who you could have been. Admit you were never intent on loving anyone but yourself. And sacrifice is the ego's kryptonite and your heart is a tomb, mummified corpses where we are only body parts and the thighs will haunt you. And the breasts will mock you and the asses will shit wherever you lay and the fists will find you on street corners, in alleys or offices, in a titty bar or atop a lover or below one erotic and afraid. Everywhere there will be a fist and your knees will buckle. And there was a curse, some manner of sorcery, stanzas upon stanzas of stories, and we will feed you morsels of your own medicine, pages and pages of feeds, and the pharmaceutical industry will go broke, and the doctors will all become witches, and to the roots of plants, sayings, and sorts of rituals, and banks will go bankrupt, values of play, a fair negotiation between gifts, and land will be unowned, where the mountains meet man, and hurricanes demolish your safety, and the police will wither in confinement with no commissary, mad sirens looped, fidgeting in the corridors of time, and developers will lose their hair and teeth, and the Supreme Court will drown in menstrual blood, pages and pages of blood, and we are the book of revelations, and the end is near, and this is where you pray, and this is where your God doesn't answer. And this God don't take no bribes unless, of course, you repent, except repenting doesn't reverse nature. It cleanses and only love, only love, only love will get you through. The next poem is called, What Riots True? If we don't talk about the moments we fought back, the efforts to resist. We will forever go down in history as being complacent with our oppression and therein complicit in the oppression of others. Tell the stories of those who fought back and why, what compels a person to anger, to radical love. They'll tell you militancy is a story of soldiers intended to kill and not of lovers intent on living, nor of the grass that uproots concrete pavement or storms that cleanse land. Nature is militant towards survival. We are taught a history of mis misconceptions, distorted partial truths. Indifference is a deafening death. The scripts we live by animate us with meaning. We argue from dawn to sunset, but if we are not united, we will be enemies tomorrow. If we do not have food, we cannot think. Full bellies let us reason with nuance. Hunger is a person not full. Half empty people obey any hand that feeds them. Do not argue with hunger unless you are prepared to have your hand bitten off. Depressed as you may be, this too shall pass. Everybody is mourning. It's not just the family. No one owns the pain. Everyone is terrorized. Let go of yourself. You can only move as fast as you will. Even the best of us is no better than the worst. Once a word is spoken, you cannot take it back. There's no such thing as those children. It's our children or it's no children. When young people can't vote, 
Their political voice is protest. It's much easier to organize a rebellion when all the tanks are pointed at the same place. Then your identity is who am I? What kind of person will I become? It didn't occur to us that you can come back from a beating until Fanny Lou. Hypocrisy makes people happy and truth makes them sad. Compassion hushes wrath, a generation destroyed by Facebook. The human face is undecipherable and they can't read anything that doesn't look like them. Everyone can hear your thoughts before you think them. We quarrel with self. Conversations are quiet meditations, poems wrinkled by loneliness. Google maps the heart, passion, is a prison of surveillance. Emotions are actionless and actions are emotionless. People expect comfort more than freedom and individualism becomes self-care. But the women are freeing their nipples. True or false? Hot afternoon, you on the couch, me tapping keys, you making music, me pacing the room, you curling up with an ulcer, me stroking your cheek, you saying how painful pain is, me saying that would suck on a sticker, you shaking your head, me lifting your chin, you looking up, you winning, me getting the call, me thinking what the fuck, me calling your name, you lying there, you motionless, you mouth open, you mid-song, me stroking your cheek, me punching the wall, me kicking myself, me slapping the wheel, me speaking at your wake, me weeping at your wake, me breaking down, me swimming in memories, you dancing at Politan vibes, you fluttering at rainbow wings, you belting out Kijo songs, you getting laid in New Orleans, me loving you, me losing you, me losing you. Buniyadi. So Buniyadi is a place in Northern Nigeria. Um, and about five years ago, we got the news that 69 young children, boys, had all been slaughtered in at this um, boarding school. And I wrote this poem in their honor and in their memory. There will be no glory in this war, no victor, no worn, torn leaves in history books, no praise song for homecoming kings, no applause for the cause, no clanging of swords, no song for the symbols. When the North is nothing, but a scrawl on a blackboard, and the East is eating the South, the West will pull out its teeth and hold blood in its mouth. Everyone will remember the days when we knew the shoemaker from the brush in hand, the hand in bush, the bush burning the hand at wrist. Everyone will remember when a school was painted with the blood of 69 boys 
whose names we never call. Everyone will remember when virgins hanged themselves by their hymens, when 300 girls slept with the snakes of Sambisa, forest of the forsaken. For God or for country, the only moral for these mortals is loss. In this lock horn of cross and crescent, smiths in red loincloth widen the needle's eye for the chalked camel on her dance to the riverbed. Falling. I tell you of my darkness, and every time you ask, there's more? I cannot see your hand that reaches for me when gloom outshines light. I say I am near the end. You watch me fret and fight the current. It is the madness, not the method, that keeps me beneath the surface. I am accustomed to the futility of war against a war to war. You tell me you are here. You say I have to ride it. I imagine myself on a magic carpet, falling through the roof of my living room. No doorbells, no doors, just a pink post-it note to remind me that I am still here too. Hi, um, my name is Bridget Minamore. I'm a poet most of the time, but this is a piece of prose. It's an extract from a longer thing that I'm working on at the moment. Um, and the extract is also named after the anthology. It's called New Daughters of Africa. You will get your hair done. Your auntie who's not your auntie worked from the hive of a high rise seven stories up in the air. The lifts round here are always broken, so you climb one step, two step, leap to avoid a puddle of piss, four step, five step, six step, manoeuvre around the boys who have colonised this stairwell, eight step, nine step, land on the tenth. Twist your body and do the same steps all over again, now you are on the first floor. Repeat six times. Arrive at a black gate, rusted but strong. Ball your fist and knock through the gap you find between two wrought strips of iron. Wait for the door to swing open from your body. Wait for the gate to swing open into your face. Look at the child who has opened both door and gate. Step inside. Time passes. Your auntie who's not your auntie is perched on the edge of a wooden hardback chair. She speaks into her mobile phone, the crack screen linked to back home resting taut between her chin and collarbone. Aunties round here like to multitask. Aunties round here like to talk. She speaks a language you only half understand. Or she speaks a language you don't understand at all. Or she speaks a pigeon that you understand more the more you listen to it. Her mouth is wide, her voice is wider. The sound of her speaking to someone who is not you fills the room. Ricochets off the high life she plays on a loop from a weathered stereo. Bounces around and settles a little too loudly inside your ears. You are sitting cross-legged on a frayed pattern cushion, bum sore, legs cramped, mind resigned. Your back is a solid mass against the heat of her crotch. You and this woman have become so close you are now the same person, perhaps. Both machine and its end product. Your neck rests taut between her knees, your head periodically pulled from side to side as she braids each weft of hair. Right hand, thumb, middle finger slip the strands together, index hook underneath. Wrist turns and pulls the hair under, never over. Left hand and left fingers join in to mirror these movements. And now she has begun. Her fingertips are ballet dancing in the air between your head and her breasts. Your auntie, who is not your auntie, is making magic from and through and with your hair. For hour upon hour, you stay here in this spot. Nothing to focus on beyond the volume of her voice. The hum of her music, 
and the yelps her two or three or is that four children make as they buzz by the back of the front door. Loud mothers breed loud daughters, loud mothers breed loud sons. Products of our parenting. You sit, get your hair braided, watch the similarities across generations and wonder, is it this obvious when people see you and your own mother or your cousins and their kids or the girls from church and their children? Around here, maternity feels mandatory sometimes, despite old stigma of young bellies weighed down with new life. These ends where babies seem to be born before their mothers. Meanwhile, mums rarely got credit for moulding and building their kids in a kiln of cracked pavement slabs. There are less of them now, you think, unripe teenagers, all baby hairs and too early baby bellies. Still, you remember the, teen the newspapers from your own teenage years. Large fonts and graphically close photos, headlines decrying these singular mothers, blaming them for the fact their children were being cut down like weeds. Why have we had no follow-ups? Front pages used to scream teenage mums in record highs, but no one has gone back to show the 29-year-olds you know, feeding and clothing and preparing their own teens to go out into the world still. Life turned out different for you. You might have read Keisha the Skip, but you didn't act on it. You might have met the man down, down the park, but never for too long, you kept your head down instead. Face first in books back then, knee deep in toil these days because every day is work day. Grinding because if you don't, who will? You work as hard as your mother does, overburdened and underhyped, find it easier to cross between worlds than your brothers can, dark boys who colonise stairwells and estates. Often, their voices aren't allowed to code switch across postcodes like yours is. Their voices could be raw against silver, but they'd still fall on ears too beeswax to hear. Dark boys round here are heard as having dark voices everywhere. Yours though, your voice is tempered by your gender. You are allowed to have a posh voice and a road voice and you are not sure which voice is yours. You have chipped away at your voice for so long you have forgotten what you actually sound like. There are many of you. Black girls the wrong side of a line made of brown paper bags, parents low income but hardworking, you new daughters of Africa born with expectation tattooed across your backs. You made your way to centuries-old universities in this new land, building so white your skin felt dirty, where elites commented politely on the way you mispronounce hyperbole, epitome, segue, but also water, laughing, mother. You would drop your T's and G's, find a V where there is none, water, laughing, mother. Wrong, they would say. Wrong. So you shaved your words into shape. You scrubbed your council flat from the flat of your tongue. You learnt to move your mouth and hands less. You convinced yourself your accent was a mess. And so you point blank banish blatantly and yeah but and wallahi and nah and rah and oh my days. Years of being told you sounded white or stush or posh. But now, now you are road. Now you are. You are. You. Posh voice. Bouncing between dialects depending upon who you're speaking to. You talk to people and you want to cry sometimes because you cannot tell if this is your real voice. If this is what you are supposed to sound like. Now you have forgotten your first language. Not the ones your parents speak or the pigeon hybrid, hybrid that you understand more the more you listen to it. No, with every passing day you lose the language of your only true home. The words wrought from cracked pavement slabs, those weighted words spoken by boys who colonise stairwells. Now you know how to speak properly. You arrive at your auntie who's not your auntie's high rise front door to get your hair done. This voice, your voice for today, is fully formed now, a voice wrought against the paving slabs that surround this block. The lifts round here are always broken, so you climb seven storeys up in the air, sweat pooling at the base of your silk-covered neck with each step. You have always had to work hard to make your hair work. One step, two step, leap to avoid a puddle of piss, four step, five step, six step, Maneuver around a group of boys who look to so many like men. The stairwell they have colonised smells like weird and opportunity because these boys are always working.
<laughs> you glance over them, a murder of navy and black, a shoal of Nike tracksuits and side bags, these flightless birds, these fish still swimming out of water. You wonder how hard it must have been for them to grow here, to sprout from the cracks in the pavement slabs. You breathe in, breathe out, breathe. Let their grimy afro beat trap drill rap beats that seep from their cracked screens through the bottom of your lungs. What does it mean that the music they are making now sounds like what you were all raised on or sounds like what their parents escaped from? Back home drum beats versus artillery fire. You go to raise with your mates and are reminded of Daddy Lumba ringing in your ears as your mother forced you to pass an uncle another bottle of super malt, petulant splayed across your face. You scour YouTube and hear gunshots. The music these boys play loudly and proudly from phones in the corners of stairwells is fresh off a boat that sailed straight from your diaspora childhood and you are in awe of it. Their music is London and Accra and Birmingham and Lagos and Leeds. Their music doesn't know anything more than what it is. Their music is settled in its chaos. You know that they are as you are. Desperate to connect with their parents, or parents' parents, or parents' parents' parents. You and they are desperate to have a home somewhere, but you know, as they know, that this is perhaps impossible, so you and they want to at least sound like you've all found one. You will get your hair done. Walking past boys who have colonised concrete they had no right to, you ascend eight step, nine step, land on the tenth. Seven stories in the air, fists poised to knock through a wrought iron gap. You assess the ways you have changed since the early days of coming to this home to get your hair braided. You are older now, your head is lighter now, less weighted with expectation and two full braids. Still, sometimes you look so heavy. It happens more the older you get. You wear a lot of jewellery because it's nice to be reminded there is something else that weighs you down. You keep your too long acrylics on because being physically unable to do every single task you're asked to calms your anxiety. You took the earrings and now is off at uni. Sent them away alongside a voice you once had that you're not sure is still yours, but now your jewellery and acrylics and voice box have all returned. As have you to this place. Here today, here tomorrow and the next and the next. Now you have accepted you are part of this place. Now you have accepted you are part of this. Now you have accepted you are. Now you are. You are. You. Thank you very much.